The Surface Pro 3 was an incredibly impressive device that set a standard for two-in-ones for the better part of the last decade. Now, we finally got a refresh in the Surface Pro 8, which has a brand new redesign, great features, and great internals. But is it everything that a Surface fan is looking for? Let's talk about it. This is an OISO, and this is the Surface Pro 8 review. Let's start with that new design. I love the Surface Pro 8's new design because it still has a lot of Surface character, but with a little bit more modern edge to it. The curved sides is one example, and of course the small bezels is the larger example. Now, I had a question in an earlier video about my criticism of the small bezels of the Surface Pro 8 and the Surface Pro X. Now, granted, if you're using this purely as a laptop, then the small bezels are perfect because you've got more screen real estate for a smaller footprint. But if you, instead you are planning on using this as a tablet device, the small bezels are just a little bit too small in order to comfortably use it without accidentally touching the edges of the screen. I frequently have that problem, and now with the new screen controls, it's been really frustrating for me. But I'll talk about the features of Windows 11 a little bit later. One side effect of the slimmer, curvier design is that there's no longer any USB-A ports on the side. Instead, there's now the Surface Connect port and two Thunderbolt 3 ports. Thunderbolt 3 is an awesome addition, and it meant that I was able to connect an external graphics card to this, which I'll detail in further later in the performance section. But I do really miss that USB-A port. There are still way too many accessories that I use on a daily basis that require a USB-A port, and I just don't like having a dongle for everything I plug in. If I had it my way, then I would opt for a Surface that was just a little bit thicker or had one of the kind of retractable USB-A ports that open up on some devices, that would be really awesome, but I don't think Microsoft would include it or go back to it. In terms of specs and performance, the base model Surface Pro 8 that I have here has a Core i5 11th generation, eight gigs of RAM, and 128 gigs of base storage. But thankfully, as I showed in a previous video, you can easily upgrade the storage with this small little port right here, and it takes just a couple minutes, which is really awesome. This model currently has a terabyte of storage, which I don't really have to worry about filling up, which is awesome, and I'd love to see other manufacturers follow suit in more accessible ways. Of course, other manufacturers still allow you to upgrade their storage, but a lot of times it takes taking off the back panel, flipping over various motherboards, or anything like that. And obviously, Apple doesn't allow for it at all. Unsurprisingly, the 11th generation Core i5 was incredibly fast in day-to-day -day performance, to the point where this actually felt even a little speedier. Now, one potential reason for that might be the 120 hertz display, which is a faster refresh rate than I'm used to on most other Windows devices, save for maybe gaming laptops. Personally, in Excel or answering emails, I would probably prefer the 60 hertz refresh rate to save a little bit on battery life, but if you're maybe gaming with older video games that could run on a faster refresh rate, this might be a better option, or if you're using this as a tablet. Over the last couple of weeks, I've specifically opted to use this as my primary tablet rather than any of the iPads around my house, which was a little bit less difficult than I expected. In terms of watching content on this, it is significantly better than the iPad because it has this kickstand as an option, and the speakers are really, really impressive for this size. The problem comes not when I'm actually on the content that I'm watching, but getting to the content that I'm watching when trying to navigate through this as a tablet. Now, Microsoft has made a lot of changes to the whole tablet experience in Windows 11, and I covered these more in detail last summer. I will cover them even more so with a final build in a couple of weeks, but until Microsoft kind of solidifies Windows, I'm not going to release that video. For now, I can tell you that I still do not like the changes that Microsoft has made to the gesture navigation system on Windows 11. Swiping in from the left, getting you to the widget screen is still kind of spammy. It feels like it's just a walking ad for Microsoft's Bing services. The touch navigation features in order to quickly get between apps using three or four fingers, apps with three fingers, desktops with four, are great in concept, but I also have been having problems with those being consistent. Quite often when I'm on a browser, the three fingers get recognized as first one or two fingers. And so the whole screen ends up scrolling first before it ends up reacting to the third finger, which just makes for a kind of a clunky UI experience. I would greatly prefer being able to just easily swipe in from the left like I could 
on older versions of Windows 8, for example. But hopefully Microsoft will continue to optimize the experience of using this as a tablet rather than just leaving it out to dry for several years again. One potential way that that will happen is through Android applications, which I have tested out the beta, which was very, very much a beta. It's not there yet, but I will cover it more in my full review of Windows 11 whenever it's ready. Let's move on to the more traditional metrics of performance on this device. I put this through a lot. Tried to edit photos and videos on it. I ended up putting a very, very heavy amount of Excel files on it. And I saw whether it could stand up to other very, very capable devices like the MacBook Air M1. And the result was mixed. Like my Surface Laptop 4 from last year, this could technically edit 1080p videos on it, but the experience was missing a lot. Quite often I saw dropped frames and was unable to quickly export videos in order to get them published. So instead, the MacBook Air is probably the better option if you want just a good video editing machine, at least in my experience. The same goes for the little bit of 3D modeling that I tried on this device, but some of the performance caps might be coming from the eight gigs of base memory that I have on this. Maybe 16 gigs would fare a little bit better. Same thing goes for video editing, but keep in mind that my base model MacBook Air also has eight gigs of RAM and it fares just fine. Maybe the swap memory is faster, I'm not quite sure. When putting this under heavy load, it gets warm but not unbearably hot, and the fans never got to a point where they were like exceptionally loud. Yes, I could hear them when I leaned in a little bit, but it wasn't like something that you'd hear from across the room. I did do a little bit of gaming on this, although I am not a gamer. I set this up with a RTX 3070 Ti in a Razer Core X external graphics card enclosure, and the result, I was really impressed with. Now, granted, I was only running on 1440p 60 hertz, but it held very, very well here. It was really awesome. I got to play the new Halo, got to play Forza, a couple great modern apps that ran like butter, which I was really, really surprised to see. Now, granted, it is using an external graphics card where most of the actual burden lies on that graphics card, but if you want to be able to use this as like a catch-all device to do everything, getting an external graphics card is an option, you know, once they are back in stock. Now, granted, if you're already setting this up and connecting this to an external graphics card, you might as well connect it to a larger monitor. So that kind of defeats the purpose of the 120 hertz refresh rate, unless, again, you're playing older, less demanding games at a higher refresh rate, maybe MOBAs, for example. I recall just a couple of years ago, Intel promising that their 10th or 11th generation chips would have significantly better graphics performance. And while that is truly the case, it's only significantly better than former integrated graphics on Intel chips. This is not to the point where it'd replace a modern graphics card, which is just a little bit disappointing, but not a surprise. If you are an aggressively casual gamer like me and you like playing Overcooked in your spare time, then this will be able to handle it just fine. Just don't expect it to play most modern games without the help of an external graphics card. Up until this point, you might interpret this review as mixed. There are a lot of good things and there are some bad things about the Surface Pro H, but this is where things start to go south a little bit. Starting with the battery life. The battery life on the Surface Pro 8 was a disappointment. I really wanted to use this as my primary device, so I brought it over to the couch, I'd use it throughout the day, and quickly realized that I was just burning through battery life. On a typical day, I could maybe hit five hours of battery life here. Granted, I put it under a lot of stress. I edited video on it sometimes, and but even when I was only doing some light coding on it and some light gaming, I still wasn't able to get more than, say, seven hours of battery life, which is a real disappointment. Even just watching videos, I saw 20% of the battery get degraded in two hours, which 10 hours seems like a good number, but there are a lot of other modern devices that are able to last for a lot longer. Now, personally, a lot of times throughout the day, I'm not too far from a charger. Being at a docking station at my desk or being near a charger on my couch, there are a lot of options for me. But if you are kind of the productive type on the go and want to bring this to a coffee shop, then you're going to have to find a place to plug in, which is just a little bit frustrating considering that we've been expecting better battery life. I really wouldn't mind the device being a little bit thicker to get significantly better battery life because 
As I've mentioned before, this is not really the perfect device for holding as a tablet. The other frustration that I've had with the Surface Pro 8 is in the bugginess. Now, granted, Surface devices have never been traditionally great out of the box when it comes to the reliability. It usually takes a couple months for Microsoft to kind of rein it in as far as the bugs, but something about the combination of the Surface Pro 8 and Windows 11 has been kind of devastating for me. Granted, I am on an Insider build, so it might not be the case for everyone, but I am on the most stable Insider build, the release preview build, and I really have been having more problems with this than any of my other devices that are also on Windows Insider Preview. It just frequently crashes and then just shuts down completely, the blue or green screen of death. I you know, pick it up from the corner of the room where it's playing a video. When I lift it, for some reason, it immediately crashes and then forces a restart, which if I'm you know, in the process of doing something important can be very frustrating. In the future, I will follow up in the comments if this experience changes in the near term. Maybe I'll go back to a more stable build of Windows 11 and see if it fixes the problem. But it's weird how many problems that I've been having with this that I've seen a lot of other people have as well. Even outside of the gesture experience, the experience of using this on a tablet is still not very good, considering one of the biggest problems that I've always had with Windows tablets literally tapping in a text field or a search bar and the, the keyboard not automatically coming out, this on Windows 11 still has that problem, which is just absurd. It didn't even only happen in Chrome. It also happened in Edge, which I didn't understand at all. Every other tablet seems to have this figured out. When you tap in a field, the keyboard should pop up. Instead, I find myself frequently tapping the button in the bottom right corner that opens up the touch key keyboard, which by the way, the touch keyboard on Windows 11, I don't need GIFs. I don't need emojis. Just give me a good keyboard that has good prediction because the keyboard on this, when I swipe on any word, it predicts the weirdest words that I would never naturally say. And I wish I had the same keyboard that I had on my Android devices, Gboard, for example. It'd be really interesting to see if Windows ended up opening up their keyboard API so that anyone could make a touch keyboard. I don't think Google would, but it'd be interesting to see if it, they did. But let's not end it on a bad note. Let's talk about what makes any Surface great, starting with the trackpad and keyboard. This, like many other type covers before it, is still very, very impressive and my favorite of any tablet keyboard. The keys all have a lot of travel, they're comfortable to type on, and all the keys are in the right place as far as the layout goes. Then the trackpad is still relatively large for any tablet device and super smooth and usable. Now, of course, the other benefit of this trackpad or this type cover over previous type covers is that it actively charges the pen as well, the slim pen. I like the slim pen in that it's my favorite tablet pen to use, but unfortunately the actual experience on Windows 11 is still lacking compared to the experience on iPadOS, for example. All in, I have still loved using the Surface Pro 8. There is a special place in my heart reserved for Surface Pro devices, which might mean that I have a bias, but there's something about being able to pull out a Surface Pro 8 in a flight and have a full desktop experience in a super slim form factor that doesn't have the problem with bumping up against the seat in front of you. That's not the experience that I get on iPads because they're less capable for me, and not the experience that I get on a traditional laptop because it's less portable. This is kind of a special in-between that I still love using, but, I really hoped that the Surface Pro 8 would be the perfect next device for me, that I could get rid of my MacBook and start using it for video editing, and I could get rid of my iPad and start using it for content consumption. But at this point in time, it's better for me to have a perfect device for each of those processes and not go with the Surface Pro 8. If instead you can only experience one device, you can only have one device like this, the Surface Pro 8 is a good jack of all trades, even if it is far from a master of none. Thank you for watching NOISO. I 
I hope you like this review of the Surface Pro 8. If you did, be sure to watch my other Surface coverage in the Surface playlist that I have linked somewhere here. Thank you for watching. Let me know down in the comments what you thought of this review and I'll catch you next.